Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, just to add to what uh, Johnny said, I've been occasion an occasional preacher for quite a few years, but um, I haven't actually preached for probably 18 months to two years. Um, and that's just been because of COVID and what went on in the church that I was, was in and my transition um, to here. So it's a huge privilege to be here today and thank you for um, having me and listening. So I know how you're all used to um, Johnny's bad jokes. I know he loves <laughs> a joke or two or three or sometimes six or seven. So I thought that... Um, I'd start with a joke this morning, and Johnny's promised to laugh because I always laugh at his. <laughs> a pastor, known for his lengthy sermons, noticed a man get up and leave during the middle of his message. The man returned just before the conclusion of the service, and afterwards the pastor asked the man where he had gone. I went to get a haircut, was the reply. <laughs> But, said the pastor, why didn't you do that before the service? Because, the gentleman answered, I didn't need one then. <laughs> it's a terrible dead joke, sorry. Let's just pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we come to explore your word this morning, I just pray that we would open our hearts to what you have to say. And Lord, may my words be from you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Nehemiah 8, let's recap really briefly. You will recall that many Israelites have returned to Jerusalem from exile. With the city in ruins, Nehemiah has led the people in the restoration of the city. And we read that bit a few weeks ago about everybody getting involved in building the walls. It's a physical restoration of the city of Jerusalem, but beyond the physical revival of Israel, there's also a spiritual revival coming. So this morning, we're going to explore two themes of spiritual revival, repentance and joy. And at face value, we might look on these as opposing concepts, but as we explore them through this account in Nehemiah, we'll see how intrinsically linked they are. And let's keep in mind how we too might witness spiritual revival in our churches and in our town. So verse one, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring the teacher of the law to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. And then they listened to Ezra read the book of law from daybreak till noon. As Johnny said earlier, that's about six hours. Not quite long enough to require a haircut, but still exceptionally long. And what's more, we read that they weren't drifting off. They weren't snoring loudly. No, all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Could you listen attentively for six hours? And we read that it's not just some of the people, not just one or two of the people, but all the people. I don't know whether it struck you during the reading how many times it said all the people. It's a collective act. All the people gathered, all the people listened attentively, and all the people said amen. Now, my understanding is that there were approximately 50,000 Israelites who had returned to Jerusalem from exile at this time. This was a massive gathering. And as we will see, there's an outpouring of God's spirit to reach a massive number of people. This gathering and the reading of the book of the law, it was planned. It didn't just happen, it was planned. They put up a special platform for Ezra to stand on. And there were men stationed around to help the people understand. It was planned and organised. The people had collectively come to listen, wanting to listen. Little challenge for you, as a church body, are we collectively listening to God's word 
and seeking him as the Israelites did here. How often do we come to church to gather together with a plan, an eager desire to attentively listen and see God's spirit work among us with power. So the passage goes on. The people listen attentively to the book of the law and the result, they weep. Then Nehemiah said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So why were they weeping? What was going on with them? Were they weeping because the sermon was too long? Were they weeping with relief that it was finally over? In truth, when God's spirit touches people's hearts and truly convicts them of their sin, it can be painful. We feel remorse. We might feel dismay at the way we have treated others or treated God. And this is what was happening with the Israelites. God's spirit through Ezra and the Levites explaining the law to them had turned their hearts back towards him and had led them to a state of repentance. The word of God was truly at work here. But during the physical restoration of the city, God's spirit had been at work in their hearts. There had been a spiritual preparation leading to repentant hearts, a turning back to God. And the ultimate outcome was spiritual revival. How often do we come to this point of repentance? How often do we weep with repentant hearts for the hurt we might have inflicted on others or for the disregard we might have shown God for all that he has done and provided us with? The Israelites did not have the privilege, as we have, of knowing God's ultimate redemptive plan of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice to atone for their and our sins. And yet God's spirit still moved them to repentance. From our point in history, we have little excuse not to come very humbly to this point of repentance as we look to Jesus and his suffering on the cross. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, by whom we are redeemed, washed clean and reconciled to our heavenly father. And as we come to Jesus, our saviour, yes, we confess our sins. Yes, we repent. But do we then accept our forgiveness and take hold of the joy that is found in the knowledge that we are loved, that we're forgiven? As we repent, Jesus Christ is delighting in us. He's delighted that his sacrifice brings us to him and to his father. So back to Nehemiah. The people have listened for six hours and they're weeping in repentance. And what are they told to do? Go, have a party, celebrate, eat, drink, have a great time. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. I love this. For all those people in the world who think Christia of Christianity as being about rules and religiosity, just look at this. Repentance leads to joy, joy and celebration. We've just read that as they went on and celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, they had seven days of partying. Our God is merciful. He loves us. And when we turn to him, when we repent and are restored to him, he's not downbeat and frowning. He doesn't go, oh, well done for saying sorry. Don't do it again. That's not his attitude. The heart of God was gladdened by the Israelites. He was delighted. This was a time for celebration. His people had come back to him. God himself was full of joy. And we see this pattern of unconditional love and acceptance illustrated again and again and again in the Bible. Just think of the prodigal son returning to his father. There was a party, not a telling off. So let's talk more about joy for a moment. How joyful do you feel today? 
I'll be honest with you, my joyometer has been at about a 2 out of 10 for the last few weeks. It's not been a great start to 2022. I now work in a school and one of my colleagues um, has left, leaving a huge void. I've been carrying a tremendous amount um, and it's left me exhausted. Um, my family has had two or three weeks of um, someone having COVID in the family. First it was my son, then it was my husband. For those of you who've experienced it, it's quite difficult dealing with a divided household. And actually, I don't like it. It feels a little bit, a little bit weird. So that's stressful. My son split up with his girlfriend. Oh, my goodness. I was not ready for teenage emotional stress. <laughs> Give me toddlers back. Um, my husband's been put under a huge amount of pressure with his job. My daughter got dropped from her hockey team. More teenage stress. And you're hearing me. Um, and this week, just because I've been so tired, I've just made silly mistakes. And that's horrible. And it's frustrating. So as we've approached this week, and I've got half term this week, I have to say my cup of joy is pretty empty. But should it be? Where does joy come from? What is it even? If you put into Google, let's face it, we all use Google a lot, I'm sure. What is joy? You will get all sorts of very deep and meaningful phrases expressing joy as being present in the moment or enjoying other people's happiness or finding joy in nature. All very good things. But joy that comes from the Lord is so so much more than this. Nehemiah tells the people to stop weeping and grieving for their past demeanours against God. It's time to celebrate. The, this day is holy, he says, holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. God forgives. He forgave then and he forgives today. The Israelites' sin was forgotten. God had moved on. He was already on to the rejoicing bit. And we read in verse 12, Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. They celebrated with joy because they had understood the word of God. They had understood the depths of his grace his mercy and his love. Where there is true heartfelt conviction and repentance, the result is the joy that comes from God. Not the earthly happiness type of joy when things are going well and all is hunky-dory, but joy on an unearthly level. Let's deviate back to Jesus for just a moment because he is a favourite of mine. Hebrews 12 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What kind of joy must this be for someone to have been able to endure such a horrific death? Well, Jesus had the joy of knowing triumph over death, evil, Satan and sin. That's pretty great. But his ultimate joy was in the reconciliation of God's people to their heavenly father. In his sacrifice was a complete revelation of God's love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness and his righteousness. This was the joy that was set before Jesus. This was the joy the Israelites received. And this joy is available for you and me. So back to me and my rubbish few weeks. I've learned a big lesson here. Joy isn't about how happy we feel with our circumstances. The joy of the Lord is found in the knowledge that Jesus paid for us on the cross. The joy of the Lord is in repenting and turning away from sin and towards the Lord. The joy of the Lord is knowing that we are reconciled to God just as the Israelites were. And my prayer for all of you today is that you will go away from this place with the joy of the Lord in your heart. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for getting me through that and not making my legs shake. 
Lord, I thank you that you are with us, that you love us, that you care for us, that you delight in us. Lord, I thank you that we are your joy. And Father, I pray that you would move us as a church, move us as individuals to repentance where we can find your joy. I ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.